10, 4 through 10. Romans 10, 4 through 10. If you don't have your Bible, break out your Bible app. If you don't have your Bible or your Bible app, you're going to have to trust me. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describes the the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doth those things shall I live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh of of this wise, say, not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is, to bring Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is, is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Let me, let's, let's not bypass that real quickly. That if you will confess with your lips the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And so ends today's word. Amen. I knew there was something I was missing when I left the house this morning. And usually I'd, I'd have a printed translation for me, and I forgot it. So I'm grateful we have that Bible here. So, title of the message today, the peanut butter burger, the peanut butter banana burger. And while I was on vacation, we, we stopped at this one restaurant. And at the restaurant, it was, uh, it was the family. It was mom, dad, Debbie, Bill, Bruce, me, and uh, a couple friends, John and, and Mona who uh, they used to work at Allegheny College, but now they live down around that area. So we're all at this burger joint because you obviously, you go to the beach to eat burgers. That's actually the only place we could get into that night. So we're sitting there and Mona's on one side of me, Bruce is on the other, and we're looking across the menu and we see, yes, it's right there, a peanut butter banana burger. Who here is going, yum? My thoughts exactly. We were sitting there looking at it, and we're all tempted. We're like, Elvis. And so what is Elvis famous saying about TCB? What does TCB stand for? Come on, taking care of business. And so we're looking at that burger, and we're going, it looks really good. That looks really yummy. Bruce, you got to get it. Nah. Mona, you got to get it. Nah. Branch, you got to get it. Nah, I'm going with the jalapeno bacon jam. And, you know, Mona went with, uh, I think, a shoestring burger, and, and I don't know what Bruce went with. So that reminded me of salvation, of all things. We all went with the most palatable option we could imagine. It wasn't what was new. It wasn't what was unique. We have no idea how good that burger is. We just know what we want. So there sits the burger. We know all the flavors but we've never tasted them together. We know about salvation, but we've never really tasted it. We want what is familiar. We fear surrendering to something that we've never experienced in our lives. And it reminded me also of a wedding ceremony. And in the wedding ceremony, they say the two will become one flesh. Two will become one. Now, it doesn't happen when they pick the flowers. It doesn't happen when they're at the reception. It doesn't happen during the ceremony. It's going to happen at the kitchen when they're trying to decide who's going to cook and who's going to clean. It happens when they're trying to figure out who's going to get up in the middle of the night because of that baby. It doesn't happen at the ceremony. We just want to go to heaven. We don't want to complicate it. We all want to get to heaven. We all want to be one with God. But in the meantime, here I am, all my flaws, all my mistakes. I'm living in the process. And here each of us stands in the middle. 
And I recently was walking, and everybody knows I like to walk on the canal. And I was walking on the canal, and something always fascinates me. And that is, every now and then, I've got to look back to see how far I've gone. Because if I'm looking forward, it looks like that end of the tunnel is getting further and further away. I'm in the middle, though. And I look back, and I see how far I've come. And it's awesome. It's amazing. Because I'm not where I once was. I'm not who I once was. We're not who we once were. If. If we are in Christ. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old man, he's gone. He's done. The new one has come. I'm not what I once was. If. If we are in Christ. And I found out and I've discovered that if we will walk with God, we will be a new creation. But the problem is walking with God. And here's the key. Again, that little key. I love that little key. It's not about doing good deeds. It's not about being an ethical person. It's not about being a good person. It's not about how many times you park your backside in a pew. It's not about how many songs you know or how much you do, or how good of a person you are. It's about making Christ the Lord of your life, because when you do, make him the Lord of every part of your life. He will change you and conform you to the image of Christ over time. And here's what God knows. If you think that you have already arrived, Arrogance is sure to follow. Moses wasn't even called until he was 80 years old. How many of us here are over 80? I think, what, two or three, four? But let's change the conversation a little bit. From what will happen when I die, not about where we're going to go or when we're not going to go, not about what's going to happen when we die, but how do you gain heaven? What is salvation? What does it mean when some Christians ask the question, are you saved? And I generally try not to use that term because people who aren't Christians, and even some Christians, they don't really know what it means. Saved from what? Saved from whom? But the word saved, it's a very important word for Christians. So if someone were to ask you, are you saved? How would you answer? Or better yet, what if they asked, do you have salvation? We might still be stumped. What does it really mean to have salvation? I want to look at a few scriptures that may surprise us on how that word is used. So let's, talk, let's look at a couple. Number one is a story in Luke 7, where Jesus goes to eat at this Pharisee's house. And while sitting at the table, a woman of the city, a quote-unquote woman of the city, in other words, she's not somebody who has a really good reputation. She's a sinner. She's got, all, she's got a reputation, but it's not a good one. She's talked about a lot. She wears a scarlet ass, whatever it is. She's a sinner. But she comes and she anoints Jesus' feet with her tears, an ointment from an alabaster jar. The Pharisees, the Pharisees is just beside himself. You know, he's, he's going in his head, he's going in his heart, he's going, this just proves that this guy, he calls himself Jesus, he's not the son of God, he's not, he's not a, um, a prophet, he's allowed a sinner to touch him. And Jesus knew what the Pharisees was thinking and told him a story about two people who owed money to a money lender. Money lender. One owed ten times more than the other and both were forgiven. Jesus asked, which one would love the money lender more? The Pharisees correctly answered, the one who has the greater debt. And the one who had that greater debt that was canceled. And Jesus then explains to the Pharisees, he had not washed Jesus' feet. He had not greeted him with a kiss, nor did he anoint Jesus with oil. But these were all things that the woman, the sinner, did. His point is the one who is forgiven little 
loves little. While the one who has forgiven much loves much. Then Jesus tells the woman her sins are forgiven. And he tells her in Luke 7, your faith, your faith has saved you, has saved you. Go in peace. What Jesus is literally saying is her faith in Jesus, her belief that he is who he says he is, her belief and her desire to make him the Lord of her life has made her well. Her faith has restored her back to health. She is whole again. And hold that thought. In Luke 8, we read about a woman who has been bleeding for 12 years. And when she reaches through the crowd, she touches the garment of Jesus, and Jesus immediately feels that something is going on. She immediately was healed. Immediately she was healed. And Jesus stops, and he goes, who touched me? No one admits it. Then the woman comes forward and tells everybody why she touched Jesus and how she had been immediately healed. Jesus then said to her, and this is very important because this is one of the only this might be the only time he used this phrase. He goes, daughter. Jesus goes, daughter, your faith in him and who he is and what he promises. Your faith in making him the Lord of your life. Your faith in him, your belief in your heart and who he is has made you well. Go in peace. You don't see the word saved in that passage. Yet the word for being made well is the identical Greek word. And compare these two lines. In Luke 7, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. In Luke 8, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Identical meanings. They both have the same understanding for us. And at the root of the word salvation is the image of restoration. We're restored back to wholeness of health and spirit, wholeness in our relationship with Christ. Now, because you find salvation in Jesus does not automatically mean you are healed. But it does mean you should now be a different person. And that is crucial in salvation. So if we look at the word salvation in the Bible, how many times do you think it's mentioned? It's mentioned 45 times. Because as soon as I let you all guess, somebody's going to guess 102. And then that's going to make 45 sound really small. So 45. And it's a straightforward salvation. It means just what it says. Salvation, to be delivered. We read in Acts 4.12, as Peter spoke before the Jewish council, he told them about Jesus, and he said this, which gives us both salvation and saved. And he said in 4.12, And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is no other way. Our deliverance and salvation comes only from one person, and it sure as heck ain't us. It's through Jesus, and we are saved and restored through Jesus. And the interesting thing about the word salvation is that the root word, the root word in Greek for salvation is Savior. And that's cool. And it's amazing what you can learn when you come to church. Then this, and it starts to put it all together. Jesus, who is our Savior, if we believe, if we have faith is our Savior, is the one in whom we find salvation. Deliverance, so that we can be restored, rescued, healed, and made well, which all means saved. So then when we ask if someone is saved, meaning are they really a Christian? Because we have so many people who are sitting in pews who have no concept of making God their Lord of their life. Have they been restored in their relationship with Christ? Have they been made well? Are they a new creation because they have been delivered by Jesus? You see, our salvation isn't in what we say, what we do. Our salvation is in Christ. It's not even in coffee. Two weeks is a long time to go without preaching. 
Uh, how do I get this salvation, though? Paul tells us in the great passage from Ephesians 2, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works. Because if it's a result of works, if it's a result of what we can do and can't do, how much we can give, how much we can't give, how many times we come to church, how many times we sing a song, how many times we do this or that, if it were about that, then we could boast. But it's not a result of works. It's not a result of our effort or what we give so that no one may boast. The Bible says that what they thought was the end. So if we think back to when we were talking about the walk to Emmaus and sneaky Jesus. So you got these two disciples. you got Cleopas and you got Cleopas' partner, probably his wife, but we never know for sure. And they just came back from seeing the crucifixion. Their heads are down. They just thought it was the end of everything. So they're walking back to Emmaus. That's where they intended to stay in disappointment, eat some bread, go to bed, figure out what to do the next day because everything just ended. They just saw their faith crucified and died. But once they saw who had snuck up with them and walked that seven miles with them, once he broke the bread and they saw what seemed to them to be trivial, as mundane as a seven-mile walk, became important. So they turned around and they got up and went back to Jerusalem at once. And you thought that the miracle was about that seven-mile walk to Emmaus. No. And you thought salvation was just about God getting you out of something. No. That second seven miles is when you turn back around and you stop running from what God saved you out of and you start running towards what God has saved you for. They got up at once in a moment and they returned to Jerusalem. This may be the strongest message on salvation you will ever hear. They got up and stopped running from what they thought God was getting them out of and started running for what God wanted them for. And Paul is telling us that we receive a gift from God. There's nothing you can do to earn the gift. And the gift comes because simply we believe. We have faith in Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior. It's God's grace. <coughs> God giving us something we totally, totally do not deserve. Yet God offers us this gift if we just believe. If we just confess with our lips and believe with our hearts. There's nothing you can do to earn salvation. You can't give enough money. You can't do enough works. You can't do enough good deeds. You can't be moral enough, ethical enough. You can't be a good enough person or anything else in order to be saved. And again, we see that word saved. And that is the exact same word we saw in Luke 7 and 8. But if we're talking to somebody, if we're talking to somebody about being saved and asking, are you saved? My first question is going to be, from what? Because I'm a pretty good person. I'm a sweetheart. My mama told me so. My mama lies. Encourage somebody next to you. Turn around and look at somebody next to you and say this phrase. Look at somebody next to you. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Turn around. Say, it is just the middle. Because this is just the middle. It's not the end. Just like when they thought it was the end at the cross, at the crucifixion. This is not the end. This is the middle. And I think it's significant when they reached Emmaus and Jesus revealed his presence through the scars he suffered for their salvation, he disappeared so that they would turn around. When they got to the place they thought they were going, they found out, surprise! And look at verse 32. They got up and started talking to each other. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us in the middle of the road as we went. 
Isn't it amazing how our hearts burn with our love for God as he travels with us and speaks with us as we journey through down that road to Emmaus in our lives? That's where you get it. That's where you grow. That's where he shows up in the middle, in the middle of the night when it's just you and Pastor Pillow and nobody left to text. There's nothing left to scroll to on Instagram or, or Facebook or, or even TikTok. That's where he shows up. You'll hear his voice in the middle, of the, in the middle, in the middle. I want you to look at that cross again. So I want everybody to close your eyes for a second. Just close your eyes. And imagine those three crosses up on that hill. If you're looking for the grace of God, put your eyes and picture that cross in the middle, that cross between the two thieves. On your left, that's your past. On your right, that's your future. But you don't look at your past. You're not going that way. You're not there anymore. You're not that person anymore. Don't even worry about your future because God is already there. He is the great I am. He always was, he always is, and he always will be. If you're looking for the grace of God, if you're looking for salvation, you look in the middle. That's where you'll find it. You can open your eyes now. He is with us in the middle. Maybe it's not about God getting us out of something. Maybe the reason he died is because he wanted to get into something. Maybe it's because he wanted to get up in y'all's business. Maybe it's because he wanted to get in that intimate, personal relationship with you. We learned a couple of weeks ago when we talked, first started talking about, not first, but in this series, started talking about who God is. God is the great I am. And then we talked about how God wants a personal relationship with you. If you, hadn't, if you don't remember those messages, they're on YouTube. They're on Facebook. God is the great I am, and he wants that personal, intimate relationship with you. And your faith is hanging between those two thieves. What was is gone. What will be is unknown. If you're looking for the grace of God, if you're looking for the glory of God, the glory is in the middle. And I know it's in the middle because... Y'all help me out with these names. I'm a Southern guy, and I was raised a Southerner, which means I have no idea about how to pronounce some words because it's pronounced differently to me. There's Shadrach. Y'all know Shadrach. There's Mesach. How do you, is that right? Meshach. And then Bubba. Bubba. Abednego. So you've got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abed. Yeah, Bubba. They all get thrown into this fire. And God didn't, he had the power to get them out of that fire. But he didn't get them out of the fire. Late at night, when the flames were at their highest, seven times hotter than they normally were, they knew they would not bow before the Babylonian king. So scripture says, a fourth individual went into the furnace with the three who were thrown in. God didn't get them out. He got in the middle with them. He got all up in their business, and he protected them, and he saved them. The choice is ours. We can surrender our lives to him. We can die to self and live for him. We've been talking about sneaky Jesus and the walk to Emmaus, the disciples thought it was the end. It was easier for them to believe it was the end because that's what they saw with their eyes. They saw their hopes dashed. They saw their depression and their doubts all creep in. It fit with their true beliefs. The peanut butter banana burger was sitting on the table in front of them, but it was too, too easy to reject it. Who here really wants to eat the peanut butter banana burger? I'm dying to try it. I am dying to try it. It's not the worst thing I've eaten. At the dinner, I mentioned, and I'm going to throw a couple of people under the bus. At the dinner, I mentioned at the beginning, Bruce was on my left, Mona, my friend, was on the right, and we all noticed the burger, much like the disciples had noticed Christ on the cross. We talked about the burger, much like the disciples talked about what was going on in front of them, talked about how Christ was on the cross, still thinking before it happened, he's going to turn it around. 
This is like the Steelers versus the Ravens. It might be the fourth quarter. The Ravens might be ahead by a touchdown, but I cannot believe anybody in this area is not going, Steelers still got it. They can come back. Because they're sitting there thinking, Christ is on the cross. He can come back. He can take care of it. We talked about the burger. Then we turned our back on the burger. We stopped considering it. We went with what was easy, what was familiar, like the disciples turned from Christ and turned to the world. We stopped having faith sometimes in our lives, much like the disciples stopped having faith just when the miracle was there in front of them taking place. They were told it was going to happen. I was told that burger was going to taste good, but I didn't go with that burger. I went with a jalapeno bacon jam burger because, first of all, has anybody heard of bacon jam? I hadn't either, but it had the word bacon in it. So it had to be good, and it was. So many times we have salvation right in front of us. All we got to do is grab it. All we got to do is accept it. But it's so much easier to put our faith in ourselves and put our faith in what we believe, which is not always what we ought to. You see, we are saved from the wrath of God, from the just penalty that each of us deserves for what we've done in our lives, for what each of us has done in our lives. And the key, there's a key, there's a word again, key, and the key is the sin we've committed in our lives has moved us away from God. And here's the thing. God doesn't care what the sin is. Lying is just as much of a sin as killing somebody. Gossiping is just as much a sin as adultery. I have been in churches where you will hear pastors spouting out hatred for somebody because they're different. You've been in churches where you have the congregation that is, is gossiping, is talking about people. They're committing these little sins because they think the little sin is so much better in God's eyes. No, it's not. Because here's the key. Again, key. The key is it doesn't matter what the sin is. Every sin moves us one step further away from God. One more step. Here's the time we cussed out that driver because they cut in front of us at the Walmart parking lot. That's going to be two because I know what come out of my mouth. So here's the other sin. We lied about something, so we're going backward, not realizing there's a set of stairs right behind me, so I better be careful about my sins. So what, what happens? So we're saved from the wrath of God because of the sins we commit. And it's not that we're plotting against God. It's not that we're going, you know what? I can do a much better job than he can. So here's what we're going to do. You're going to stoop behind him and kneel down, and I'm going to push God, and he's going to fall backward over you, and then we're going to take over heaven. Y'all in it with me? No. Because it's not like we're plotting against God, because we would never do that. But we are. Because if we're not for God, if we're not living for God, if we're not believing in God, if we're not loving as God wants us to love, if we are not working on that relationship with God, in essence, we are working against God. So, we are saved from our destruction, from hell. That's what Jesus said in John 3.17. Y'all know this one. For God did not send his Son into the world to what? condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. But do we choose him, even when it means denying ourself? Even when it means going someplace we don't want to go, but it's what he wants us to do. What about when it takes time that he wants us to do something we don't feel comfortable doing? What if he wants us to go up to that person who's been very ugly to us and go, I forgive you? when he wants us to love the person that is the most unlovable SOB, excuse me, that you have ever met. Surrendering to Christ is the hardest decision you will ever make in your life. 
And it's a decision you're going to have to make repeatedly with each and every breath you take, with each and every step you take. The goal was never about the destruction of people because God wants every person, he wants every person to come to faith in him. And at the same time, mom's not here, so I apologize for the next thing coming out of my mouth. So God has given us the freedom to come to him or to be assholes, excuse me. We can either come to him or we can reject him. It is our choice. And it's a choice we make every single day. It's a choice we make every single breath we make, every single step we make. It is not saved one and done. You can be saved one minute and then totally turn your back and walk away from God because of your sins the next. And it has no bearing whatsoever on the good deeds you do, on how nice you are, on how pretty you are, on how many times you sit in the pew, on how many songs you sing, on how much money you give to a church. It comes down to confess with your lips and believe in your heart. Because that's why Jesus died on the cross for us. The righteous and the holy one had to pay the penalty for you and for me. Jesus paid the price as the atoning sacrifice that you and I deserved and still deserve. So look to the cross. If you're looking for the grace of God, put your eyes on the middle cross between two thieves. Your faith is hanging between those two thieves. What was is gone. What will be is unknown. But that's where the grace is found, right there in the middle. And the end is called forensic justification. I love theological terms sometimes. And it means God makes what we would call a legal declaration in which he declares a person just and righteous because of the work of Christ on the cross. We're not righteous, but God views us that way because of what Christ did for us on the cross. Imagine what it would be if we looked at every single person around us as God looks at us. Imagine how different our view of humanity would be. Imagine how different our view of ourselves would be if we took a second and lived that our identity is in being his child. If we believe. If. If we have faith in Christ. So when we accept Jesus as Savior, as the Lord of our lives, God declares us righteous. And too often we take it for granted that it's from Jesus, and that's all I need to know. I've been saved. I'm good to go. I checked off the box. I went to church today. I believe the more we know and understand about our faith, the better we can also help others come to know Jesus and to know when someone is off on their belief system. But what do I need to do? What do I need to put my faith in? We get that answer too. Repeatedly in the New Testament, we're told salvation is found, you guessed it, in Jesus. I know somebody was going to say, in my football team, or, or in my sporting events, or in my Sunday afternoon lunches with family, or, or in myself because I'm a good person. But no, we're told salvation is found in Jesus, only in Jesus. So how do you become a Christian? Because some of us are still struggling with that. What do you need to do? And if we go back to our scripture today, Paul says it well in Romans. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, Lord of your life. Not Lord of part of your life. Not Lord of your life while you're in church. But Lord of your life on Monday too, and Tuesday, and Wednesday, and Thursday, and the rest of the week. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, 
and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. It's having a sincerity, a true belief in your heart. Start stating it with your mouth, who you believe Jesus to be. Accurately, of course. That's why we have each other. And you will find salvation. You will be saved, redeemed, made well. Your spirit will be cleansed. You just went through the car wash of faith. And you'll find salvation. You will be saved, redeemed, made well, cleansed. God will now declare you to be justified, made righteous in his sight. There will be a day to celebrate like no other day. You see, salvation is about more than just getting your ticket to heaven punched. Salvation and eternal life begins, begins on the day you embrace, you actually embrace an intimate relationship with Jesus as your Lord and Savior. It's about becoming a new person on the inside that the world can see on the outside. It's helping the world to see a new you. And the world marvels at how you've changed and they celebrate this new person. And you go into the world and you seek to be a part of that change. You grow your discipleship and you transform the world, not because of your acts, but because of who you are living like. When we receive salvation, we enter a process with stages and steps, not instant changes and not immediate transformation. We're going to stumble. We're all going to choose ourselves over Christ at some point in our lives. We're going to choose our will, our desires, our hearts. So we ask God with our lips and with our hearts to forgive us of our sins. We repent, which means we seek to no longer do those sinful acts that we have committed in the past. We turn our lives, our heart, our spirit over to God so God can continue to cleanse us and make us whole. We just need to turn from the world, from our usual hungers for the world, from our sinful natures, from our sinful heart, and try something new. Surrendering our hearts and our lives and our wills to God. In other words, just like Elvis would say, we need to take care of business. Not ours, his. Not our will, his will. Not our hearts, his heart. Even when it seems as unappetizing to ourselves as that peanut butter banana burger. The key is to have faith in Christ. Take that key that you've been given. Keep it with you as a reminder every single day. The key is not in you. The key is in Christ. The key is to have faith 